I started playing in 2009 with Echo. Some friends of mine came to visit and we took the dogs to a local park, but we didn't have a, a water dish. We'd forgotten to bring a water bowl. So I stopped at a local store, picked up just some cheap kid's disc. A few days later, I had noticed that Echo was starting to carry the disc around like everywhere we went. She'd, carry, she'd pick it up as soon as I walked in the door from work. She would take it outside with her. If we were going somewhere in the car, she was taking it with her. And so I started to try to see if I could actually throw it. Um, and I was a terrible thrower. I'd never thrown a Frisbee in my entire life. Had no clue what I was doing. There was a competition in Jamaica, Virginia. So I went up there, took Echo with me with the intention of doing nothing but watching because we didn't know what we were doing. But by the end of that Saturday, some of the club members had basically said, you know, you should try it. So that Sunday was a flying disc dog open or what we call FDDO. And we ended up placing sixth. For a boxer, in my opinion, that's pretty good. Cause she's only one of like maybe three boxers in the world that I know of that play. The history of the modern flying disc can be traced back to the 1940s, when a young California inventor by the name of Walter Frederick Morrison developed the early prototypes of what would become known as the Pluto Platter. Morrison later partnered with Whammo founders Richard Nur and Arthur Mellon to release the first patented Frisbee disc. As the sport of flying disc continued to evolve, the interest of many athletes wishing to include their canine companions was imminent. Early canine disc history recalls a border collie belonging to Reverend H. A. Curtis of Kentucky in the late 1960s. Amidst a wave of the advancing frisbee craze of the 1960s and 70s, one young Ohio State student would soon find himself on the fast track to frisbee stardom. His name was Alex Stein. I was a college student at Ohio State University in 1971, and my girlfriend was a breeder of whippets. And when her dog was bred, she said that, Alex, you can have the pick of the litter. When the, the litter was born, I looked at this little black and white newborn, and, and uh, I said, that's the one I want. Ashley accompanied Alex on many of his outings, including games of Frisbee at Ohio State. And I would take him up to the, the College Oval and throw Frisbees back and forth with my friend, and he would run and get it on one side and run back and forth, back and forth. And it started to get really cold, and I said, you know what, I'm going to drop out of college, and I'm going to go to Florida, get a job in Florida, and play Frisbee with Ashley Whippet. I would take the dog to the beach every day, and running on sand and catching a Frisbee, this dog learned how to jump seven feet off the ground on sand. While Alex and Ashley honed their game in the East, another dynamic duo was making its own waves along the California coast. 
a young dog trainer by the name of Eldon McIntyre and his talented dog Hyper Hank routinely used the sport of flying disc as a means of exercise and play. We had a property down in Rancho California that my in-laws had with a huge, huge front lawn and we used to play a lot of human frisbee down there when, when uh, you know, at the end of a meal or whatever. And I had an Australian shepherd that basically just had got in the game. He wasn't, it wasn't a premeditated thought or just something that he got tired of being ignored when everybody was throwing and, you know, an errant throw and he became involved. Hyper Hank, an Australian Shepherd, was a world-class athlete all his own. As simple as it was to see a dog snare the disc was something that became, I became aware that it had some impact potential because, you know, it was, it was just so new. I mean, you know, having never seen a dog do it before, and then all of a sudden a dog's grabbing the disc out of the air. It was a lifestyle sort of thing for Eldon it was for anybody who was playing back then, so, I mean, Hank was with Eldon all day, every day, like a lot of those early dogs. Those dogs were lifestyle dogs for the people that owned them. In the early summer of 1974, Alex, noting Ashley Whippet's athletic prowess, set out for stardom in the ever-famous Tinseltown, Hollywood, California. I knocked on talent agencies and made phone calls and told them I had a dog that jumped nine, nine feet in the air, twisted and contorted his body, had a 92% accuracy rate, and they said, you have a what that catches a what that jumps how high? And they hung up the phone on me. I knocked on the, the door, whammo, and I talked to the, the, the uh, receptionist, and I go, hey, I just drove out here from Ohio with my dog, and I got, you know, I want to show, you know, the, the CEOs of of, of, of whammo, what frisbee dogging is all about. And the receptionist said, oh, hold on a second. And she made a phone call and they were actually in a, a, a meeting with the, the two owners of, of whammo and Irv Lander was in this meeting too. And they came out to the, the front of whammo and they had a little grassy surface there. And I waved to him, I said, hey, I, I said, watch what my dog can do. And I, I, I had this beautiful blue Super Pro Frisbee that I had just bought in the store. And I floated it, you know, on this grassy area and Ashley jumped eight, nine feet in the air and twisted and contorted his body, you know, like he always did. And I put a little four, four minute show on and then the, the guys go, well, thank you for that show and, uh, you know, we'll be in touch. Frustrated, Alex became desperate to garner the attention of Hollywood. A couple weeks later, I'm driving down the LA freeway and I'm listening to the Los Angeles Dodgers, Vince Scully, doing the play-by-play -play on a Sunday, bat, Sunday afternoon baseball game. And uh, he, when the game was over, he made an announcement. He says, well, if anybody's interested, the, sp the big red machine of Cincinnati Reds are coming to Dodger Stadium to play Monday night baseball. And a light bulb just like lit up. I parked the car in Dodger Stadium parking lot and bought a, bought a ticket to the game. It was a nice balmy evening in, in, in Chavez Ravine, is the name of the stadium in, in LA. Brought Ashley into the stadium. I snuck him in, came in the gate that I walked in and I grabbed a seat. At the bottom of the eighth, a sudden disturbance along third base occurred as a small, sleek, black and white dog and his owner leapt over the rail onto the playing field. So I, I walked down the 26 steps that were onto the field and I, I jumped over a little three foot retaining wall and had a frisbee, you know, in my, you know, in my hand and I just, I just tossed it and Ashley flew after it and jumped, caught it, and the crowd went absolutely crazy. And when I, I, I looked around and, and, and no security came on the field to, to grab me, I continued to play. I, I marched to center field. I even said to the center fielder, I go, hey, you want to throw a frisbee to my dog? And he goes, he goes no, I'll probably get, I'll get fined if I do it. Finally, after eight minutes, I said, you know, I got to get out of here. And I ran up the same stairs that I came down, which was a mistake. And when I got up to the top of the stairs, there were like 10 security guards that grabbed me and, and like zip-tied my, my hands together. And 
Dodger security swiftly grabbed, cuffed, and swept Alex away to a local jail. Ashley, still wanting to play, remained on the field for some time before leaving in search of Alex. A young teenager rescued Ashley from the stadium parking lot and took him to safety in Long Beach. As Alex sat in detention, concerned for the well-being of his beloved Ashley, a guard approached, delivering Alex's first big break in California. I'm down in jail, worried, where, where's Ashley? And, you know, am I ever going to see him again? A security guard comes up to the cell that I was in and hands me a business card. He, I, I looked at it and, it, and the business card had Los Angeles Rams, and underneath his name had halftime coordinator. And then on the back of the card said, call me. And I just like went, yes, this is, that's my moment. I wanted to be in front of the, the, the public eye and I snuck on the field hoping that somebody would, would, would hire me to, or see me and hire me to do more shows. In the stadium that balmy August evening was the executive director of the International Frisbee Association and longtime Whammo employee, Irv Lander. Although Irv and Alex had met previously, Alex's daring feat at Dodger Stadium caught Irv's attention. Alex, seeking release from his detention, called Irv shortly after the game. Irv, being the kind man he was, drove to the 10th Street station and sprung Alex from holding. My dad had a talent for becoming friends with people. Um, all kinds of people, and uh, even people who perhaps seemed a little offbeat. In fact, I think he really enjoyed that kind of a relationship, and he hit it off with Alex, and they, you know, they were friends forever. News began to spread of Alex's Dodger Stadium appearance. All of a sudden, I hear coming through the media that there's been this dynamic dog that wowed the crowd at Dodger Stadium, and I was a fan of a program on KFI Radio in LA called Loman and Barkley. And they were kind of a tick, you know, kind of, they're just kind of out there. And I called and I, I sort of put it on the table. I said, you know, there's a lot of talk about Ashley Whippet at Dodger Stadium. Well, I've got a dog too. So they put together an event, which was at Cal State Fullerton. And it was called the Fearless Fido Frisbee Fetching Fracas. And really at that event was where everybody came together. Alex was there, Irv Lander showed up, represents for Whammo. I mean, it turned into kind of um, a really special event to sort of put people together and get people to be aware of just what, how special it was. Eldon won that first canine disc competition. Following the fearless Fido Frisbee fetching fracas, Alex, Eldon, and Irv became close friends, traveled the country, and began developing the first official Canine Disc Championship Series, the Ashley Whippet Invitational. Early Ashley Whippet Invitational events occurred in Pasadena, California at the Rolls Bowl, alongside the World Frisbee Championships. Often, Frisbee competitors would mingle with the canine disc handlers. One by the name of Peter Bloom would later become an integral part in the canine disc sport. My first uh, world champ human world championship was in 1975 at the Rose Bowl, and that's when I met Alex Stein and Ashley Whippet. Irv Lander asked me to throw along for the dogs as part of the exhibition after the competition was over just to entertain the crowd. And I was really enthralled with Ashley, and Ashley was a small little Whippet, and you would just not believe the height and the speed uh, and the intensity of that dog. And then we'd do shows um, at sporting events, uh, football games, and, and um, race tracks and stuff. And I would do the human stuff, Alex would do the short stuff with uh, Ashley, and then I'd do the long throws. Over the course of the first official World Championship events in 1975, 76, and 77, Alex and Ashley earned top prize, becoming the first team to win three consecutive world titles. Because of his size, the jumps looked that much higher, and his leaping and his speed and the, and the athleticism was just, you know, it was, it was unsurpassed. Ashley was innovative just because he was so electric. To see Ashley running was like unbelievable, just the, the curvature of the body as he ran and the speed, and he would just, you know, nose to the ground, and then the last second, those little springs of legs, and just all of a sudden he's eight, nine feet in the air. Ashley was a phenomenal 
leaper. He would pull a disc off of a goalpost, but his grace and his style and his t speed for the distance was amazing. Ashley was unseated in 1978 by the team of Dink and handler Jim Strickler. These dogs are amazing. That's Dink. And he's challenging last year's champion, the great Ashley Whippet. While developing their early competitions and championships, Alex, Eldon, and Irv spent countless hours touring the country, promoting America's new canine pastime. When you put Alex and I together, it was, you know, Hank and Ashley work well together and their dynamic, they were different. And then Irv was the, the key component of that because he also had the network of high level people in parks and recreation because he had Junior Frisbee, he had Hula Hoop at the time, so he had a network of cities, the big cities like Philly and Dallas and these places. It's, I mean, just to see those three, um, it was all in their blood. I mean, it's just Irv put his whole heart into it and Eldon put his whole heart into it and so did Alex. Everybody loves dogs and Irv was a genius. He had all the inside connections with Whammo. I mean, Irv just didn't do Frisbee dog comp competitions. You know, he was the spearhead of all the junior competitions for years. Um, he was involved with the Rose Bowl competitions. Irv had his hand in just about anything that had to do with Frisbee back in those days through Whammo. Irv was in the sport long before I was. I mean, we are a result of his vision, and yet at the same time, we're not. He didn't ever envision what the sport is today. Irv loved dogs. He rescued dogs. He absolutely, uh, nobody that ever met that man could ever deny his love of dogs. Irv Slander set up media events with every newspaper, TV show, we would go to the park and a reporter would, it would interview us and said, everybody go and enter a, a Frisbee dog competition and get a free t-shirt and a free Frisbee for signing up. And then when you saw the impact of it and what it did for people and how much people enjoyed it, that's when the touring began. And then when we put, put the event in play, then we would be involved with you know, different events around the country. And then as we would travel, we'd do a lot of promotional, a lot of promotional things. One event in Southfield, Michigan where I think we had a Newfoundland, a boxer, you know, it was just people coming out to try. And his formats were always put together so that people could come on a given day and, and try without even preparing. It was just pure having fun and an owner that was excited to be a part of it. Eldon and Alex, along with Hyper Hank and Ashley Whippet, would perform exhibitions for fascinated onlookers. They landed performances at professional sporting events like Super Bowl XII and national landmarks like the White House during Jimmy Carter's time in office. Ashley, only measuring 21 inches tall, had become the face of Canine Disc and was the adoration of dog owners nationwide. He was sponsored by Cycle Dog Food, had his own credit cards, was a regular performer for the Los Angeles Rams, and the inspiration for an ice cream parlor in Connecticut. Alex retired Ashley from competition in 1980. In 1985, Alex had to say goodbye to his beloved Ashley. Alex, his family, Eldon, Irv, and the nation mourned the passing of this incredible canine athlete. As Irv was leading the way to market and develop this new sport, competition started to heat up. Then when we started seeing that it started to become, people became more creative and, and sort of understanding. I think that it was kind of a, a way to get people to, to develop throwing. Uh, when Herb was around was the, it, the innovative throwing that came down. I mean, because it, it was a way to get another level of, you know, the, the creative approach, but to challenge the dog. And the way we used to look at it is the disc dog, pure disc dog competition would be challenging your dog with the disc in flight athletically. I remember our first freestyle routine is we went out with one disc. You do it behind the back, you do a you know, wrist flip, you do something else, and it was like, you know, one disc. And then somebody goes, well, can I use a couple disc? And then, you know, the rules kept changing and stuff like that. Going to the World Finals was the first time 
that they would play music to freestyle. And, uh, uh, and that didn't really happen in the sport till a few years later when you could bring music at a regional level. We would come up with the top 12, 14 dogs in the country and that was, the, that was a very, very big day. One dog came off as a champion. The early competition format featured a bullseye style of toss and fetch, while freestyle was exactly that, free. You only had freestyle in the beginning at the world finals level. I think 79 was the first time they had freestyle at the regional and nobody knew what freestyle was. So in those early days, you could have a really good dog and be an okay Frisbee player and you, you could do well. Longtime human frisbee athlete and canine disc exhibitionist Peter Bloom began competing with his dog, Whirlin' Wizard. Peter's excellent disc skills teamed with Wizard's athleticism led to the first routine to be fully choreographed to music. Putting together the routine, we added a number of things that hadn't been seen before because we came from the human side. Uh, we did a simultaneous opening, simultaneous moves. We did a, a tap trick, which is where I'd throw it to him upside down. He'd bounce it back to me with his nose instead of catching it. And so we, we tried to bring something new to the sport. In 1984, Peter and Wizard won their first and only world championship. My goal was to compete, to see how good we were in relation to other people. And if we won the world championship, you know, there's, there's not a higher goal than that. So we reached that goal. And then I thought, well, what can we do now as a new goal? Following their championship victory, Peter continued developing new tricks, including one of the first body vaults between dog and handler, the thigh vault. Other versions of body vaults began to emerge. Ron Ellis developed the signature back vault while Lou McCammon brought forth the amazing reverse chest vault. In 1993, Gary Suzuki and his six-year-old canine teammate Soaring Sam found themselves among the elite. Sam always had the drive. He was a working dog. Incredible drive, incredible athleticism, very intelligent, very stubborn, and you know, a lot of people I remember used to say, I wish I had a Soaring Sam or if I had Sam, it would be different. And what they didn't realize was with that intelligence, there came a sense of stubbornness where the training involved, it was, it was pretty intense. The reward was the companionship and the bond, but it took quite a bit of training. We went to that first regional, and actually I believe we were fourth. The regional at that time included California, Arizona, Nevada. So there was quite a large number of competitors in our region. I think there was maybe 80 competitors. I believe the next two years I was right at the cut again. I was third and the fourth regional I actually won and went on to the world finals. My first world finals I was uh, the first runner-up. Uh, the second world finals I was the second runner-up and then I was fortunate enough to win the world championships and continue the next two years. For the next two years, Gary and Sam were seemingly unstoppable, becoming only the second team to win three consecutive world champion titles. Sam was, he was an amazing, amazing canine and very intelligent, but there was extreme challenges <laughs> with Sam as well, and I don't think everybody realizes that. There's really a, an opportunity to develop an omnipresence with the dog through the sport. That was my initial attraction. In Ashley Whippet Invitational history, there have only been three teams to take home three consecutive world titles, the most recent being Chuck Middleton and Bling Bling. Go, 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 go. 
So about a year after we had started playing, um, because Echo was more of a toss and fetch dog, I really wanted to get into freestyle. I put out the word on social media that I was looking, I was preferring a young Australian cattle dog, anywhere from six to 10 months. And I get an email from a friend of mine out in Florida saying, hey, there's this dog in Ohio. He's bounced around to multiple foster homes. I mean, he had been in, I don't know the exact number. I think he'd been in like six foster homes in eight months or something. He had bounced around quite a bit. He had bounced around so much, he wasn't very stable. You know, it's not that the training he had prior to coming to me was bad because he had great trainers along the way. Um, he just had no stability. He had no boundaries, no nothing to stand on, no grounding. But I think within like a week to 10 days, he had fallen right into place. Like he was home and he knew it. I knew it. I still had questions. You know, I still questioned what I was doing because he, he had some behavioral problems. placed third in his first event and I of course you know you have early success like that you're gonna push harder and I did which was a mistake I pushed him way too hard way too soon um, in February of that year which was 2011 I uh, took him down to Florida for an event and I broke him he shut down just stopped I had he didn't he doesn't like toss and catch to start with he never really has but I'd, I'd taken him and put him, put him in a toss and catch event, a long distance toss and catch event. Okay, up next we're looking for Lindsay Thompson and Brick. I believe this is the first time we've seen Lindsay and Brick in the quadruped. I'm looking out here right now, uh, Lindsay, you've got to beat the yellow frisbee at 30. If you can do that in your first throw, you'll be able to skip your last two throws and save your dog and arm. to the final round we were almost to the final round and I think we were we were in the final section of our heat and he just I'm done I'm done I'm, I'm stopping I'm not playing no more I've had enough you've run me too hard what is his problem but I got a I, he's a phenomenal freestyle dog I mean, he loves freestyle, hates toss and catch, still hates it to this day, but loves freestyle. <laughs>
While the sport expanded and notable women including Melissa Heater and Donna Shea made their way to the upper tier of competition, the now 20-year-old sport was heading into a dark age, wrought with controversy and chaos. It was August of 1997 during a competition in Littleton, Colorado. Radical Rush, a border collie belonging to Stephen Heater, along with the dogs of four other top-level competitors, began to fall ill. The affected competitors were forced from the competition for the health and safety of their animals. It was later discovered that at least one dog had been administered a tranquilizer. While most of the affected dogs recovered, the heaters were forced to make the heartbreaking decision to euthanize Radical Rush a few weeks later. Within a matter of days, fingers began to point to longtime competitor Bob Evans. Bob was known as a strong competitor. He was loved by most. Many felt the accusations were absurd. While the accusations flew, Bob and the heaters quickly found themselves in court facing lawsuits and countersuits until an agreement could be reached. While the sport was seemingly male-dominated for much of its history, the 90s found the sport diversifying. Many women started to compete among the upper levels of the sport. One notable athlete was Melissa Heater and her canine, Ariel Asa. It was one of those things where I was just doing something I love to do, which is train my dogs and throw a disc to my dog, and do something with my husband. And We both had a great time doing it. We didn't realize we were at the top of our game, so it was one of those fun things where you're just training, having fun with your dogs. And then you realize you start competing and winning at a world championship level. In 1997, Melissa stepped onto the championship field in Washington, D.C. with Asa and made history, becoming the first female handler to win a world title. And it does not take a commission set up by the president to realize that our winner, first female champion in the history of the sport, Melissa Heater, with 80 points. As the world began moving towards a new millennium, Canine Disc was rocked with the news that its patriarch, Irv Lander, had passed. People didn't know he was sick. I didn't know he was sick for a very long time. I think that the sport lost the one person they could call, the one person who had the vision of what it was supposed to be. When he uh, got his original diagnosis, I was there at the doctor's with him, when he got his original diagnosis that he was, you know, that he had liver cancer. His first remarks when he got up, when we walked, walked into the car, was, well, I've had a pretty good life. I've really enjoyed what I've done. And, you know, and he said, I don't, I don't really want to fight this. I mean, I, you know, I know that it's going to be a long, hard fight, and I don't want to do it, but I, you know, I'm, I'm okay with this. We got the call that Irv passed, and the next day we were supposed to go down to Indy for our regional, and Chris and I just looked at each other and said, there's no way. We can't do it. We're just, I mean, we're devastated. Just, we're just going to sit here and cry. And then we just got to the point of talking, going, you know what? Her would be the first one to walk up those stairs and slap us right now. Why the hell would you not want to go out to a frisbee dog contest? That's an insult. He was he was a unique individual. He he did quite well by promoting this sport of ours, but at the same time, he did quite well by understanding what this sport what this war was really about. And it was a, that bond between a dog and an owner. There was nothing you could do 
that he'd more enjoy than meeting a dog or just having the opportunity to, to you know, to know that he had helped somebody in the dog. And he looked on the do dog disc play as a way for people to have a reason to adopt, to have reason to have better relationships with dogs. While the championships were going on, you know, people would call and want to talk or need to pick me up or what have you, and he'd talk to them. During the off season, you know, making sure we had sponsorship and just making sure it could still move forward. His passion was for people to enjoy their time with their animal, to love being with them. If Irv told you something, you could take it to the bank. I mean, he was a man of his word. He was a, a very gentleman type of individual, and he loved everybody. He cared about everybody. It was not until 1989, 89, that for the second time, third time, I finished third in our regional event. And I, I was crushed because back then, at your regional event, it was team one and team two that, that qualified for the world finals. My only dream after reading Karen Pryor's book was to become a world finalist, right? And so I'm standing there, I'm standing there in third place again. And one of the one of the great things about finishing first or second is that you got to then attend uh, that game in the evening. Depending on the time of year, it was either a preseason baseball game or it was a uh, fall football game. That night it happened to be the Cowboys. And uh, and it was going to be the halftime show. And uh, I was standing there. I was disappointed. I don't know. Honestly, at this point, I don't know if I was more disappointed in, in not being able to go and do the halftime show or if I was more disappointed in not being a world finalist again, again. And so I was standing there and I was, I was pretty disappointed. And he looked at me He looked at me and he goes, he announced the finalists, two world finalists that would go and do the game that night. And he looked over at me and he goes, and I want you to come too. If you look at uh, almost any major movement, there's always something that creates the spark, and that was Alex and Ashley. But then the more important job after that is to make sure that that spark turns into a flame and then burns brightly for a long time after that. And that's what Irv did. You know, he was toting the wood and keeping the fire burning. Uh, he was obviously, to me, the, the father of the sport. I mean, he was just always fun to be with. He loved, I mean, he was just so giving, so loving to, to everyone around him. And uh, you rarely ever saw him uh, get upset or, or angry, although he may have a couple of times with me. As Irv's time came to a close, however, he requested his son, Steve, take control of the AWI. From what I understand, he was going to give Peter Ashley Whip an invitational. Alex didn't want it. Peter would have been the perfect choice to do it. And then I hear that on his deathbed, Irv told his son Steve to take it over. That next year, Steve Lander took it over. A couple of people had attitudes because they 
now we're looking at somebody who'd never even played frisbee with their dog, was in charge of the whole thing. Peter kind of anticipated, I believe, that, that he would have the opportunity to continue on the path that Irv was on. But I'm sure Peter was very disappointed. And, you know, I can understand that too, but you know, those interpersonal relationships are difficult. Irv's son really didn't know much about the sport, but here he was with this venue. And uh, so it was difficult for him to, to carry it on. It was, it was hard and Steve really stepped up at a time when we needed that. And then he tried for the next year to make that happen. And you figure he was not only doing it for his dad and, and everybody that he knew and trying to make sure the sport lived on, he was still also trying to run his own business and make his own living. But then Peter took it over. He kind of took, uh, told the sponsors that, you know, why would you sponsor this when I have Skyhounds going? And Peter has his credentials are a mile long in the Frisbee world. My God, I mean, there's nobody else that's done what he's done. But um, then he got the sponsors to take his event over AWI, and then Steve basically just stepped away. Uh, a couple of years there wasn't an AWI event. Eventually, Peter Bloom, along with fellow AWE employee Jeff Perry, left the organization due to creative differences with the new leadership. Soon after, Steve Lander left the AWE organization, and the championship series was left in limbo. For the next three years, there was no AWI World Championship. The sport was struggling. The headbutting got ugly and things went south for a while. Irv should have been proud the way he left it and to see it get scattered and the, uh, the blackballing, the ugly confrontations, the uh, you know, rumors and things like that that went on. It's kind of a perfect storm at the time, I think. We were losing a national sponsor, which everybody seemed to love. But you've got to remember, 16 people at the end of the year loved that. The sport was in the process of changing when he passed away. And I think it would have been great if we had him there during that you know, next 10 year period, because I think a lot of the, you know, the the waves and the choppiness in the water for everybody might not have been there if they had some a mentor like Irv around to guide folks through it. There's people that were best friends back then. There were people that, you know, that worked very closely with each other that don't even talk to each other today. When Irv passed, obviously his son Steve Lander took over and Peter worked with him for a year and Jeff worked with him and depending upon whose side of the story you listen to, you know, Steve wasn't happy with what Peter and Jeff did. Jeff and Peter weren't happy with the way Steve was running things. I mean, there was just bad blood all the way around. People did not side with Peter right away and Jeff. And so it was more difficult for them to start their Skyhounds competitions in the beginning. Very few people went to them. I think that they've proven to the sport to this day that they've got, if not the best competition series out there, at least the best organized and best run and the most um, available to different competitors. Um, all the fallout over Bob Evans and the drugging of dogs and all the stuff that went on. And so, you know, Melissa went off and wanted to start her own environment. You can't blame her. Um, Chris Sexton, Bill Keller, Tom Worley and myself, good, bad or indifferent, in those days we had some issues with Peter and Jeff and what they did. The whole thing of taking the, the trophy with all the names from the first, you know, 26 years of the sport, 25 years of the sport, and putting them on their trophy, those weren't Skyhounds people. Make a clean break, you left the organization, create your own trophy, and move on. Nobody knew what the real future of AWI was going to be at the time. And with Steve being a full-time lawyer, Peter and Jeff exiting, it was very much in limbo. I wasn't part of it. I just heard stuff, right? and you had a number of people take sides. Um, you know, when Irv was alive, everybody was sort of focused on the way that that program was run. And I mean, it made sense. He had great sponsorship and, you know, tons of qualified, talented people helping him. So it, it made a lot of sense for it to be that way. But um, there was nobody really to step in and take his place. 
when he passed. So um, I think I think that sort of opened the door for other people to say, hey, I have an idea, you know, maybe, maybe we should do it this way. And that seems to be kind of the entrepreneurial spirit that has led to other organizations doing things differently, um, which I think ultimately is awesome for us as competitors because we have lots of choices that we didn't used to have. And you don't have to play in formats that you don't enjoy. You don't have to go to places you don't want to go. You can, you know, find something you love in your area and um, do what you want, which is nice. Sooner or later, um, they'll never be the friends that they were to begin with. They'll never have the same working relationship. But I think they'll become more tolerant of each other. And we may even be there yet. But will they, whatever they work together or whatever their organizations um, assist each other and help each other, you know, I can't see the future. I, I can't tell you that. But if I had to bet money on it, I'd say probably not. Established in 1998, the Flying Disc Dog Open became the earliest organization to break away from the sponsored national event. Following their departure from the Ashley Whippet Invitational, Peter Bloom and Jeff Perry established the Skyhound series in 2000. Around this same time, another series was being developed and would become known as the United States Disc Dog Nationals. Other organizations, including the UFO World Cup Series, International Disc Dog Handlers Association, and the Quadruped, were established in the early 2000s, bringing the total number of available competitions from one to seven. It's difficult um, to keep the clubs running smoothly with all these different organizations, but I think it's nice having all these different organizations. I would have loved to have been competing today where I could go. If I don't like the feel of this one, I'll go do that one, and you know, it's nice. It was more competitive in the past because there were very few spots. However, there's more people competing now. The sport has gotten much bigger, um, and I think the level of play has really changed. I mean, you know, when I started, routines were fairly simple, and it was unusual to have um, great disc management, great flow in a routine, um, great disc handling skills. You know, not very many people had that because most of us came from a background of not playing Frisbee. <laughs> With these new organizations, freestyle began to evolve, rendering a new breed of innovation. Veteran competitors began training players across Japan, China, and many European countries. A sport that once dominated in the United States was now becoming overshadowed by talent in other countries. Asian and European athleticism and innovation became a benchmark for success in competition. It's just exploded. And, and because I go to all these different countries and I'm teaching classes and I'm judging at these events all over the world, the growth in Europe and in Asia right now is light years ahead of where the, where the United States is right now. I mean, it's just amazing how they've embraced it. And the talent level that's coming out of over there, the only reason you don't have more Europeans over here is because it's so difficult to travel with their dogs. And in most instances, it's cost prohibitive for them. But I think what's more exciting for me is to see the sport grow worldwide and to see the different styles in the sport. You can see the Europeans, the Canadians, the Americans, the Japanese, the Chinese are coming. It's, it's amazing how the sport is rapidly going and growing from the one qualifier to multiple different competitions. Well, when I started out, I think we were about 25, 30 people playing competitive disc dog, if you can call it a competition back then. And I've seen the sport grow to like a lot of competitions, maybe 40, 50 competitions now in Europe, in all different formats, in all different forms and shapes. And it's continuously growing, and that's the fun part. For example, when we started in Italy in 2006, we were four people, and now there's about 200 competitive players in Italy in, in like four, in like eight, nine years. Somebody started the Tosanvet, just Tosanvet game, but I don't like it. Just I want to do dance with the dog and. Uh, do the tricks on the music, I like it. So uh, I started by myself. Because I've won some championship titles, I've now gotten to go to Hungary, Spain, France, Germany, Mexico. We've gone from 
being a U.S. only sport. You know, the sport started in California in the mid 70s to now it's on almost every single continent. Of course, Antarctica would be a little tough, but um, you know, we've got competitors in the U.S. We've got competitors in Mexico, Canada, um, all over Europe, Japan, China. It's expanding. I think there are competitors down in Australia now. Um, so it's growing very quickly internationally. But I think as Americans, we have, we have to keep up that integrity on our side because everybody's gonna be looking at us because this is where it started. This is where the history is. Get the ego trip out of the way, get over yourself, and remember you're a representative to the rest of the world because we have this history riding on our shoulders as Americans. And I'm not saying that, that to say that the Americans are more important. No, we're all important. All competitors that play are important because we all have, we're, we have our own specific piece of the puzzle to play. With this new wave of style, one American team stood apart. Their style of aggressive play was unlike that of many American players. Tethered with a canine that didn't fit the herding breed standard, a breath of fresh air was inhaled into the lungs of this rebounding sport. Breed-specific legislation, bad ownership, and a run of bad luck had landed the pit bull breed on do not adopt lists across the country, leading many to be euthanized. Wallace came into the shelter. Um, he was uh, kind of a really energetic dog. Um, very driven. To be honest, he, he was kind of a jerk. Um, he wasn't the best behaved dog by any means. Um, and uh, people started having concerns about him, which, you know, quite frankly, I did, I did as well. I wasn't sure who would really want to adopt a dog like him. Um, however, the thing that I didn't appreciate was that um, there was a lot of other dogs that maybe like was a black lab or something like that that had similar behavior issues you know just really energetic no manners you know not doing well in that type of environment and those dogs weren't necessarily getting targeted um, for euthanasia so while well, wallace was basically because of what he looked like you know. we stood up for him and fought for him uh, we convinced them to actually allow allow them to let us take him in as a foster dog um, you know, Wallace needed something to do, so we figured why not give him a shot. He loved playing with toys. He would play fetch with Clara at the shelter. Rue, maintaining Wallace's status as a foster dog, continued to search for his forever home. Everybody thought he was a great dog, but I'm like, hey, he's up for adoption, but no takers. I didn't think we were gonna really get any takers, mainly because of the fact that he wasn't good with dogs. I felt very fortunate to be in a situation where we didn't have any breed specific laws um, but I was watching um, a lot of other areas and a lot of other dog owners go through a lot of really kind of horrible stuff where their dogs are being taken out of their homes um, dogs were being even not even given a chance at a shelter because of what they look like um, I didn't think that was right and so we I felt kind of a sense of responsibility Giving this opportunity with Wallace, I said, you know, it's somebody needs to step up and just show it. You know, somebody needs to step up and say, he's a pit bull, but he's a good dog. He deserves to live. Wallace passed away in 2013 after a long fought battle with cancer. Wallace himself was uh, like the true underdog. He wasn't supposed to succeed. He was supposed to fail. He was not the light, quick disc dog that, you know, most people would have picked. I felt pretty fortunate actually to be welcomed with the disc dog community in Wallace. You know, there's a lot of places where we had to be careful when we were traveling to competitions, you know, oh, is Wallace, you know, allowed there? But I always knew that whenever we showed up at a, an event, you know, I think because the disc dog community has a lot of uh, roots in rescue. You know, a lot of the dogs out on the field are rescue dogs that, you know, they, they welcomed us and we really appreciated that because if, if that hadn't happened, then we wouldn't have been able to make the impact that we did. Wallace did have the deck stacked against him for sure. And I think that what made him so special is that he 
<laughs> he basically looked at that deck and said, bring it on, you know. Um, it's emotional because, you know, just looking back and being proud of what he was able to do. Today, the sport is experiencing incredible growth across five continents. It's mind-boggling to me how that part of the sport has grown internationally versus growing, growing here in the United States. I actually think some of the competitors in Europe and overseas are better than they are here in America. I mean, when I threw to Ashley, it was just you know, long distance and left right curves and left curves and a little bit of freestyle that I had this little spinning move and things like that. But, but it's just amazing to see the athleticism and also I'm happy that dogs are rescued from animal shelters for the distinct purpose of playing frisbee. You know, instead of being put to sleep, they're playing frisbee and, and being loved and sleeping in their owner's bed. As time moves forward, the sport will continue to grow, offering dogs of all histories, rescues, purebred, previously neglected, the opportunity at a better life. Dogs facing euthanasia will be given the chance to know love and have their energy appreciated. I've had four dogs that were actively involved in the sport and I didn't go out looking for that magic pill. We just took in dogs because they needed a home and all four dogs were at some kind of elite level in the sport. The basic thing is, you know, you're in your backyard playing with your dog. The more people that can go and bond that, and more dogs that are saved out of the shelters because of it, that's, how can anything be wrong with that? It's an amazing athletic sport for your dog. They get great exercise instead of running after a, a stick in the backyard or a tennis ball. They chase after a frisbee and it's like a you know it's like a bird in flight and they you know for a dog to to catch a frisbee it's just you know jumping in the air it's just more you know it's just more athletic for the, more more exercise for a dog than just running after a ball competitors today have more opportunities to compete with their canines in any of the now seven competition formats I like to see it expand more and more because the more dogs that can enjoy the sport, the better it gets. And I hope that everybody can just start to enjoy themselves again and, and lose a bit the competitiveness and get back to the fun where it all started with. I would like to see everybody come together and I would like to see the camaraderie grow more in our sport about cheering on whoever is on the field. Keep this boat uh, like this. So some some frisbee dog player does too much human. But we want to do. We want to show them, show show the people uh, the bond between the human and dog. That is most important part of this sport. Not hu human do. I don't like it. I'm sorry uh, to to people like that. But uh, I want to show them the between uh, bond between human and dog, that's all. You know, Sam, he was a family member first and foremost. Your dog's part of the family and to keep it in perspective. The relationship you build with the dog, if you're doing it right, is so special. All my dogs are special, but we all have a special, special dog. Just the relationship and being with that dog all that time was amazing. I think it's absolutely incredible that we can have this complicated, intricate dance with another species. That we can do this incredibly cooperative thing. And I love that they are so joyful about it. You have to be just as graceful of a loser as you are a winner. And that's what I hope that people will learn in how the sport grows and flowers, is you have to be graceful, whether you're a winner or a loser. Don't lose what the true scope of it you know, what Rur's original um, idea was for the sport, and that's basically to go out and, and have fun with your dog, know your dog's limitations, play to your dog's strengths, uh, go out and enjoy yourself with your dog, you know, and let the, let the competition come secondary. Everybody has the best dog in the world, because if you have that relationship with them and you think that, then you do.
If you're already playing with them and you're having that relationship with them, you won. You don't have to take home the trophy. I, I think that's the thing that a lot of people miss. Don't forget that bond. That bond that, that creates this craziness that you see on the field today. It's pretty magical. We take it for granted. They both play with everything they've got every time they set foot on that field. But they do the same thing at home. When the time comes that I have to say goodbye, as hard as that's going to be for me, I want no regrets whatsoever in their lives. You know, I've, I've busted my butt to give them the best possible food that I can afford for them. I've, I've tried to give them the best possible care because they both have given me so much. They don't look at me as if I'm a monster. I was bullied as a kid. You know, I, I grew up feeling like I was the monster everybody was telling me. And those demons almost cost me my own life. But my dogs never look at me like that. They never treat me like I'm some hideous monster. They don't care. They just want to hang out, have fun. And, and I know for sure Brick's just happy to have a stable home. You know? They're both happy and healthy, and I, that's all I want for them. You could take away Skyhounds. You can take away AWI. You can take away USDDN. You can take away the UFO. You can take away the quad. You can take away every single organization. Take them all away. Just do away with it. Do away with the sport of disc dogs. And guess where you'll find me tomorrow afternoon? You'll find me playing frisbee with my dog at a park somewhere. While opinions still differ among some veteran competitors, the memory of those darker days will begin to fade. The next generation of players will heal the last of the old wounds, and one day the sport will reunite for the good of the dogs. No sport is perfect. They all have their history and none remain pure. But there is a uniqueness to canine disc. There is the primal chase of the prey in flight, followed in close pursuit by the eager predator. We should never forget the wonder and beauty of a disc in flight and the acrobatics of our canine teammates. It is this uniqueness that makes our journey special.